2021. I'm Metropolitan Council Member Reva Chambliss, Vice Chair of the Transportation Committee, and I'll be chairing this meeting in the absence of Chair Barber. There's a few things that we must talk about, uh, about how we will conduct this meeting. As you know, Governor Waltz has declared a peacetime emergency in response to COVID-19 and the Metropolitan Council Chair has determined that it is not practical or prudent to conduct an in-person meeting for reasons stated in the government's executive order. Accordingly, committee members will participate in this meeting either via telephone or electronic means, and the meeting will be conducted under Minnesota statute section 13D.021 at the date and time stated. We encourage you to monitor the meeting remotely. If you have any comments, we encourage members of the public to email us at public.info at metc.state.mn.us, and we will respond to your comments in a timely manner. Uh, while we wait for uh, establishing a quorum um, at this time, I will uh, ask for reports. So if we could have a report of uh, the TAB report from June 16th, 2021. Mr. Dugan, I cannot hear you. I think you're on mute. There we go. Sure, I can hear you now. Go ahead. You'd think by now I would remember to turn off the, the, the unmute, but anyway. No, no worries. Uh, Madam Vice Chair and certain honorable committee members, General Manager Koistra and Acting Director Venowitz, I believe uh, Amy's on the call. I can't see, but uh, the tab, as you noted, met on June 16th. And I first will go through the reports from MnDOT, MPCA, and the MAC, and then into several information items with a quick overview. Uh, MnDOT, the raised discretionary grants, which are rebuilding America's uh, American infrastructure stability, are due June the 12th through MnDOT. Also, the transit, tr transportation economic development starting in 2022, those grants are also going to be uh, Sending, they're going to be sending out RFPs for those. MPCA, in 2021, they expect to have two main categories of transportation improvements from the VW fund. One is heavy duty on road, not off road, but on road and equipment. And that's to switch them to either electric or alternative fuels. Secondly, the replacement of more heavy duty, heavy dutier, I should say, school buses that are now powered by diesel with uh, alternative fuels. At the MAC, uh, the TSA checkpoints are seeing approximately 116,000 passengers weekly, which is a quite an improvement. In June, the average flights were 404, expected to be in the 420s in July. In 2019, they were uh, in the mid 500, so probably 100 more. Uh, per day. And for your constituents, there is still COVID testing free of charge at Terminal 1, I mean, sorry, Terminal 2 pre-security and Terminal 1 post-security. We had several information items that were uh, given, presented to us. I would do a very brief overview just so you are aware. Um, and one of the one of the items was presented already to you on May 14th by Heidi Schaller on pedestrian safe, safe, safety overview. The FHWA and the FTA did their four year inspection of the uh, met well our MPO, which is for and that's required for any MPO over 200,000 in population, and that in turn is called a transportation management area. Okay. All right, that's a, we received four commendations, 12 recommendations, most of them fairly minor and no corrective actions. Uh, I may, I would like to draw your attention to the presentation by Professor Tom Fisher of the University of Minnesota on the post pandemic city. And Jenna, I, I know you know this, but if you wouldn't mind, you do it, you do everything for us. It is at, make note in the minutes that it's a uh, on the tab meeting at 56 minutes begins his presentation. Uh, he is uh, he is a, a 
na nationwide, nation, nationally known expert on urban design and chairs the uh, Dayton Hudson Chair of Urban Z Design at the university. Then the final information items were regional solicitation presented by uh, Ms. Fenowitz and Mr. Barbeau. And just to, uh, the, uh, the first one was before and after, just to give you an overview from 2014 to 2020, which comprises four regional solicitations, there were 538 projects done, 1.87 billion in funding requests of which the TAB and the Met, the Met Council and the TAB were able to fund about 800 million of those. And the key takeaways from this study is, uh, the, the main takeaway is how do the projects support the Met Council's goals, and are there too many categories? So it's unclear what um, what is being what is what is to be accomplished. And that always, as you know, is a choice between do you do one or two or three major projects, or do you spread it around as much as possible um, so that all elements of the Met Metro uh, of the city can participate of the Twin Cities. And then, as I said, Ms. Venowitz and Mr. Bar Barbeau went on, uh, presented on the modal funding ranges for the regional solicitation. And there are three main modal categories, I, just as a quick review, roadways, transit, bicycle, and pedestrian. And the modal funding tends to work at a midpoint, which has been significantly unchanged from 2014. The uh, and then in the minimum and maximum awards, the big change in 2020 was an award of 25 million to the ABRT, almost if you will, a set aside. And that was the idea behind that was the no notion that let's get one project done. And, and the BRTs usually came in for 7 million every two years, and it would frankly take forever to get them done. So now it's a 25 million uh, right off the shot. And the smaller minimum maximums are for bicycle and pedestrians. They tend to be less expensive, so uh, more money can be spread around and, and accommodate many communities. And then uh, the regional solicitations in terms of policies, criteria to qualify for an award and eligibility. Of course, this is in support of Thrive 2040 and the Transportation Policy Plan. Um, it was a, a lengthy presentation and well done by Ms. Venowitz. Uh, in roadways, the I'll just give you an example of a couple of, the, of the, the categories and what comprises them. Just very brief. In road roadways under traffic management, things such as flashing yellow lights, uh, integrated car signal, meaning if you're going down one street, all the lights all the lights are in time during rush hour. Uh, under expansion of roadways, this would be new roadways and bridges going from two lanes to four lanes. And under modernization of roadways, it would be intersection improvements such as roundabouts, turn lanes, especially when it's two to when the uh, the road goes from two to three lanes. And under the second modal category of transit expansion, under transit expansion, obviously is new transit vehicles and service, such as the highway BRTs. And under modernization, is improved boarding areas for life safety, and then improved passenger facilities, you know, heated, weather resistant. Under travel demand, travel demand management, this is where you get into your innovative strategies of tele, telework, carpooling, vehicle sharing. And finally, under bicycle and pedestrian, uh, it, under the bike is multi-use trails and on-street bike lanes, for examples. And for pedestrian, it's sidewalks and uh, ADA compliance. The only other categories of safe routes to school, which is self-explanatory and encompasses a two mile radius of any primary, middle or high school. And uh, lastly, I won't be able to see their presentation, but I have reviewed the presentation of Mr. Carlson and of Ms. Roth and it's excellent as always. And Tab, I just wanted to give you a hat, hats off because Tab always loves seeing what you're doing on the, the D, B, E and F. So great progress, thank you all. Any questions, ma'am? Thank you for that thorough report as usual, Mr. Duga. I don't have any questions. Uh, do any council members have any questions of Mr. Dugan? Oh, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome, thank you. 
Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to have a report uh, from the Metropolitan Transportation Services Director and Metro Transit General Manager reports, and then we will um, officially uh, look at the agenda and proceed with this meeting. Uh, Madam Chair, I guess I'll go first. Okay. I was hoping to have one item to report today, um, but unfortunately I haven't received the news yet and I've been anxiously watching my email and text messages. But we're hearing that the US DOT is announcing today the recipients of what we call infra grants. Um, they're major project grants, and we were joint applicants with MnDOT for over $80 million for the I-494 I MnPass Lane project. Um, we have been hearing in between that our application was well received. We've been getting questions about it, and we're very hopeful that we're going to be recipients, but so far I haven't gotten the message. So. At this point, I can't announce it to you, but hopefully by the end of today, we will have an announcement on that project and we'll be the lucky winners. And all that's, right. all I, that's all I have for today. Well, thank you for giving us uh, that tip, Ms. Venowitz. Do we have a report from the general manager? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, can you hear me? I can. Great, uh, we did receive a a federal grant uh, late last week. Uh, we received it not in the amount of $80 million, but in an amount that we're really happy with. We received the 2021 low no emissions grant uh, of nearly 4.2 million for uh, from the FTA. And this is a, a grant that will allow us to partner with the manufacturer Proterra and fund the incremental difference for eight of their 40 foot uh, electric buses. And the eight, new, uh, the eight new buses will be used on core local routes to gain more experience with battery electric buses. As we had spoken with about this before, with respect to our next steps with electric buses, we wanted to focus on 40-foot buses. So this is a great opportunity uh, to fund uh, the cost gap between electric and diesel buses and, and move it forward and advance our electric bus program. Um, I wanted to mention also that uh, I want to give a little bit of a preview that, of, that in July we will have a two-part series of presentations about our plans to emerge uh, from the pandemic uh, as a stronger transit system. This will come uh, at your July 12 meeting and then at the, at the July 26 meeting. At your July 12 meeting, we will present the first part and that will include data that we are watching regarding ridership trends and how this informs our decisions about which service to prioritize to, uh, to bring back or to increase. Uh, it will provide an overview of the quarterly service changes going into effect with the August pick, an update on operator hiring. Uh, operator hiring numbers will be a primary factor in how much service we can bring back. We again are having difficulties in hiring new operators. So that is a that is a contributing factor in our service planning. And then I wanted just to take a moment to say that we did have two successful one day hiring events last Wednesday and Saturday with 65 people attending uh, and 60 were interviewed, 42 passed the interview uh, and minimum qualifications. So we're now working hard to get their materials through the background process and we'll be starting new hires as quickly as all information is verified and the pre-employment physical is completed. The second part uh, of these information items will occur at the July 26th meeting, as I mentioned, and we will present, uh, and part two will focus on our multi-pronged approach to improving customer experience and rebuilding confidence in transit. Uh, the umbrella of the, of the improvements include uh, our approach to future service changes beyond the August pick, our commitment to service reliability, uh, improvements to, uh, to security across our system and improving the conditions of our vehicles and facilities, as well as transit fare promotions and product changes. Uh, as we again, try to come back and emerge from the, trans from the pandemic as a better and stronger system. 
Our goal is to provide you with a whole cloth picture before the end of July so you can see how we're approaching uh, this transformative time in public transit. And then finally, Madam Chair, I want to provide a legislative update. The House and Senate passed the Transportation Omnibus Bill last week. Uh, the governor signed this bill into law on Saturday, and we are grateful and really excited about the many about many of the transit prov provisions. Uh, Judge Shetnan uh, will provide more details in the future uh, to the council, but I'll cover some highlights, and that includes that we received our general fund base appropriation, which was in jeopardy at one point during the session. Uh, the legislature decided to make Metro Mobility a forecasted program, and that provision goes into effect on July 1, 2024, and applies beginning with the November 2024 forecast for each fiscal year beginning on or after July 21, 25. Uh, for bus, light rail, and Metro Mobility, we will be filling structural and COVID-driven funding gaps with federal funds through state fiscal year 2025. But I cannot overstate how important it is to our financial position to have Metro Mobility become a forecasted program. This means that the cost of Metro Mobility increases uh, beginning in 2025 will be assumed as part of the base budget and, and paid prior to the consideration of the state budget targets. This does not solve our, our structural deficit, but it will significantly improve our position, and we are really grateful for this for this change. It really approaches Metro Mobility much like health care programs in the budget, and it's a terrific advantage in for a program that, like health care programs, is a mandated federal program, and we have uh, uh, no choices in, in terms of service delivery uh, for, for these important services as that should be. Uh, the bill also includes a 57.5 million one-time general fund appropriation for arterial BRT. And we have, while we have more work to do to detail exactly how the council will designate these new funds, uh, this is a great stride and a great, and provide great progress in the ABRT development uh, but at this point, I think it's fair to say uh, that the, the funds will, will be able to transform how we deliver these projects. We will anticipate uh, that the appropriation will complete the funding for the E-line. Uh, these funds will also help advance the F-line and leave us in a position to leverage federal funding for this line. Uh, so it's, again, $57 million is is a big infusion of funds for the ABRT system and will help us advance that program significantly. Uh, the bill also included 250,000 in one-time funding to produce a zero emissions transit plan. $250,000 um, uh, will help us uh, provide a plan to the legislature that's due by February 15th, 2022, and we will be required to revise it every five years afterwards. This plan and funding will complement the work already underway uh, through the master contracts that the council passed uh, in in May. Uh, we also received authority for issuing uh, regional transit capital bonds in the amount of $98.4 million for the next two years. This is the standard authorization amount that takes the last RTC authorization and adds 3.15% as an inflationary factor. Also, 250000 was awarded to the council to analyze transit improvements in the Trunk Highway 55 corridor from Medina to downtown Minneapolis. The analysis must include options for highway BRT, and the appropriation also requires a non-state match. Uh, one thing that the bill did not include uh, was the Administrative Citations Authority. Uh, we had bipartisan support for this bill in both houses, so this is a big disappointment to us. Uh, so fair citations must still be issued by transit police. These will continue to be misdemeanor citations carrying a $180 penalty. And the decision to adjudicate the citation remains with the local prosecutors who in the past have put these citations aside in favor of more pressing criminal uh, prosecution. So while we're, we are certainly disappointed in, in not receiving that authority, I think overall we can say that there are some tremendous advantages in the bill for for transit in in our region. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll stand for any questions.
Thank you, uh, General Manager Poistra. Are there any questions? Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Poistra, for that encouraging, exciting report. Thank you for all of the work that you did and Mr. Shutman and Chair Zelli and all of the people who approached the legislature to get such wonderful outcomes on behalf of transit. It's really important and I appreciate all that work. I know it was a huge amount of work and uh, especially in this um, remote setting, it's even more challenging. So thank you for all of that. I have a quick question for you. I'm wondering about now, do we have any electric buses currently operating and what is the status of the repairs that were needed to be made to the charging stations that melted down or parts melted down or wherever we had an issue uh, earlier? Can you kind of bring us up to date on that? Dan Poistra. Yeah, Madam Chair and, and Council Member Cummings, uh, we did, uh, as you recall, at the end of February, had to take our electric buses out of service because of problems with the chargers. Uh, right now, uh, the focus has been on the depot chargers, and those chargers are still in manufacturing, but nearing the end of manufacturing. And our hope, and I'm going to phrase it as a hope, is that we will have those buses uh, back on those chargers by the end of August. Uh, there's also a matter of online chargers, which are have been repaired, uh, but they're, the long-term intent is to have those replaced also. But while they're working today, the online rechargers, uh, online chargers, uh, the, the change to the new version of the online chargers will not occur until 2022. So in summary, uh, we're hoping to get the electric buses back on, the, on service uh, at the end of August. May I do a follow up, Madam Chair? Yes, Councilmember Cummings. Thank you. Um, uh, and then, is this repair something that the Met Council, Met Transit, is solely responsible, or are we doing this in partnership with the manufacturer? Was that, were there still warranties, perhaps, that were um, in that were that we were working under, or where do we stand with that? Is this solely on Metro Transit? Uh, Madam Chair um, and Council Member Cummings, the, these are actually replacement chargers. They're not they're, the repairs. Of, there were repairs done on the online charger, but we'll get those replaced as well. But the depot chargers are replacement chargers, and they're done at the cost of the manufacturer. In fact, we negotiated extended warranties for all this work, given the amount of problems we were having in this program and with their chargers and, and their charger infrastructure. So. Uh, we've worked really hard to. Uh, we realized in the in, in that in this program it was uh, that it was more like a research and development project and a partner, and uh, we we uh, worked with with New Flyer and New Flyer work work with Siemens or subcontractor to reflect that in the warranties. So all this is under warranty. Just just a final comment on that. I think that, that really illustrates the importance of having strong relationships with the uh, people with whom we choose to do business and, you know, and recognizing that that it is a partnership. And I know that this was uh, um, uh, very almost a pilot program and there was lots to be learning learned from all entities that were involved in this. So I appreciate that everyone is working together to address this and and move forward because it isn't just Metro Transit. Uh, it will be system wide for uh, uh, all of the entities of Siemens and um, uh, all of the entities involved in the various uh, issues around electric charging. We're all still learning. So anyway, thank you for your work on that. Thank you. Thank you for that response and the question, um, Council Member Cummings. Are there any other questions regarding this presentation? Madam Chair, may I just jump in for a second? Peter Dugan from TAB. Certainly. Uh, and in listening to General Manager Koyster talk about recruiting, I'm sure everyone saw the very complimentary article in the Star Tribune, oh, probably 10 days ago on the recruiting efforts, uh, particularly among the um, you know, diverse community that Metro Transit was doing. And uh, so hats off to you, sir. Good work. Thank you for acknowledging you, that, Mr. Dugan. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for those reports. We are going to go on as we do have a quorum. 
And um, after this information, we are going to have a roll call. Uh, Jenna, can you call the roll? Uh, <clears throat> Chambliss? Here. Cummings? Here. Ferguson? Here. Fredson? Here. Gonzalez? Sterner? Zirin? Present. And Barber. Thank you all. We have called the meeting to order of the Transportation Committee on this day, June 28th, 2021. At this point, we can have approval of the agenda. Uh, I do believe we do have one change on the agenda. The ABRT information item will be moving up on the agenda. Uh, does anyone have any questions or concerns regarding that? Does not look like it. So I will go on and ask for approval of the minutes and if there are any changes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Aaron moves uh, from the, minutes. the last meeting. There was a motion made by Council Member Zarin. Is there a second? Redson will second. Redson seconds. Um, I'll call the roll chair, but we actually need to go back and then also do a roll call for the agenda since it's an amended agenda. Okay, thank you. So okay, right so now I'll call the roll for the approval of the minutes um, moved by Zirin, seconded by Fredson. Uh, Cummings? Um, aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Uh, Gonzalez, Sterner, Zirin? Zirin? I saw his mouth move. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Zirin, aye. aye. Um, Barber and then Chambliss. Aye. All right. Uh, and then going back to the uh, amended agenda, Chair. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve the amended agenda? Press and I move approval. And a second? Coming seconds. The amended agenda is uh, seconded and approved. Chair, you're on yep. mute. Do you want me to call the roll for that then? Yes, please call okay. the roll. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez? Sterner? Zirin? Barber? Mm -hmm. And Chambliss? Aye, and I, and I saw uh, Zirin's uh, aye. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, we now have approval of uh, the minutes. And that uh, completes our um, items before we go into our uh, agenda. Oh, muted again. Pardon me? Was I on mute? Okay, we will go to the consent items and there are no items on the consent agenda. So we will move on to the non consent items. 2021-145 is positive train control software support. Amendment number three. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Tony Abair, Director of North Star Community Rail. And I'm here to present business item number 2021-145, Positive Chain Control PTC Software Support Contract Amendment 3, Contract 17M165, Proposed Action that the Metropolitan Council Authorized Regional Administration a stater to execute a sole source amendment number 3 to Contract 17M165 with Wabtech Railroad Electronics, WRE, for maintenance and support of positive chain control software for a total contract amount not to exceed six hundred and eighty-four thousand one hundred forty-seven dollars and seventy cents. 
a background on this Metropolitan Council first entered into a contract 14P056 with WRE in December of 2015 for equipment installation and application of engineer, engineering of positive train control systems on the communal railroad revenue equipment. PTC is a federally mandated because of the Rail Safety Improvement Act of 2008, whereby all class one railroads must be PTC equipped and operational by December of 2015. In November of 2015, Congress, Congress passed an extension to this federal mandate, pushing it back to uh, December of 2018, with a possible extension in 2020. Uh, North Star Community Rail was fully uh, equipped and operational with PTC in 2017. Uh, PTC, a positive train control, was a communication-based chain control technology that includes equipment on the trains, along the railroad, right away, or wayside. Uh, the equipment which works together is used to prevent train-to-train -train collisions, overspeed derailments, speeding into established work zone limits, movement of trains to a red signal, and properly positioned mainline switch. A uh, separate contract, 17M165, was signed in March of 2018, adding ongoing maintenance and support services for the IETMS onboard support system for positive train control. The time for performance revision options up to four additional one year periods. Two amendments have been approved. Amendment number three will add two additional years at a cost of $245,726.43 to the contract. This will bring the total contract to a cost of $684,047.07. Uh, the requested action will authorize the regional administrator to execute a contract amendment extension with WabTech to continue software support for the community rail positive train control system. This purchase enables a continuation of safe operations of positive train control system to allow communal rail transportation for residents throughout the metro area, linking them to jobs, education, shopping, and events. Funding for this item is in the communal rail operating budget. And with that, Madam Chair and committee members, I'm open for any questions. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? If there are no questions, I would like to ask if there is a motion for the proposed action that the Met Council authorize the regional administrator to execute a sole source amendment number three to contract 17M165 with Wabtec Railway Electronics Inc. for maintenance and support of positive train control software for a total contract not to exceed 684 million 100 $684,147.07. Is there a motion to approve? Or is there any discussion, rather? With no discussion, is there a motion to approve? Is there and moves the item? Thank you. Is there a second? Personal second. The motion has been made, seconded, uh, therefore the motion is approved for business item 2021-145. Next we have item number 2021-2. Is there a question? Chair Chambliss, do you want me to call the roll? Um, Cummings? Thank you. Hi. Ferguson? Hi. Fredson? Hi. Gonzalez, Sterner, Zirin. Zirin's aye. Barber and Chambliss. Aye, thank you. Chair, you're muted, sorry. Okay, um, the motion has been made, seconded and approved. So now we move on to 20-21, 2021-152. Metro D line amendment to design and construction administrative services. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, if I may, per the amended agenda, I believe that um, I'm prepared to give the info item on the arterial BRT program before launching into 2021 152. That is fine. Go ahead. All right. 
Well, thank you, Shaheen, for holding off for just a minute. Uh, chair and committee members, I'm here today with an update on the status of the arterial BRT program. I'm Katie Roth, Assistant Director of BRT Projects. And um, Greg, would you be able to pull up the slides for that info item? Excellent, thank you. And if we can go to the next slide. Our plans call for eight arterial BRT lines to be operational by 2030, building out the network in gray shown on this map. And my update today will focus on the four in active development right now, which are the D, B, E, and F lines. Next slide, please. As of today, um, construction on the D line is well underway with operations planned for 2022. Um, on the B line, we've been working for some time on the corridor plan for that corridor, and Adam Smith will be requesting council action for a key step in that process tonight. Later this year, we'll transition into engineering, positioning the project for 2023 construction and late 2024 operations. Um, planning is also well underway on the E line, and the council will begin to see a lot more on that project later this year. As Wes mentioned in his update, with the transportation bill now signed into law, we do anticipate that the E line would be fully funded by the recent appropriation and that the asterisk here um, can be removed. So the anticipated full funding of this line keeps the E line on track for construction in 2024 to align with other road projects, and we would open that line in 2025. We'll also be working to better flesh out how the appropriation will advance the F line, uh, poised to enter planning later this year. That project is on track for 2025 construction tied to the regional solicitation funding awarded by the TAB earlier this year. And also on the horizon, but not an immediate project development is the G line on Rice and Roberts streets. Um, before corridor planning begins next year for that line, most of our efforts will be focused on coordinating with other street projects advancing to ensure that this corridor is as BRT ready as possible. And of course, this early coordination is made possible because Network Next identified not only the F line, but also the G and H lines, and the council acted to name all three of those lines earlier this year. On the next slide, um, as we move forward, I'll provide a brief overview of progress on the D line, our $75 million upgrade to Route 5, which is, of course, Minnesota's busiest bus route. Next slide, please. Construction on this corridor began on April 5th, and the Thomas and Sons-led contractor team has been progressing very rapidly along this line. Uh, work is underway at a total of 19 stations, with many of those at a point where the civil platform construction has been um, substantially completed. Those are the green dots on this map here. Seven additional stations in yellow are scheduled to begin before the end of this year, including a couple down on American Boulevard where I think work has started already this week. And the eight remaining stations shown in red are scheduled to be built next spring with work concentrated in South Minneapolis and at the spot where the Green Line extension crosses over 7th Street and coordinates with the D-Line project. Corridor wide fiber optic conduit installation is also underway. This is one of the major activities being completed by a DBE firm in this contract. And following council actions to award contracts earlier this spring, the production of shelters and pylons for the line uh, is also underway. And of course, construction at this many locations is very complex and made especially so in an environment where we continue to serve customers day in and day out. And I wanna really highlight the significant work that Metro Transit Street Operations has put in to coordinate the detours and stop closures on Route 5 and the many other um, local routes that intersect this corridor. I also wanna highlight the work led by our community outreach team to distribute very detailed and thorough construction bulletins each week and keep our corridor neighbors up to speed on what to expect from construction. On the next slide, I have some photos to give you a sense of what that construction looks like. Uh, so this is very similar to what construction looks like at a lot of places on the A line and C line. On the left, you can see what it looks like when crews first enter a station site or in the first couple weeks of work there. In this case, at Fremont and Broadway, crews have finished much of the removals at the site and are getting utilities in place prior to forming up station foundations. And then on the right is one of the last steps that generally occurs before the site um, is reopened to traffic, which is pouring the platform with a distinctive gray striped pattern, um, which is common to all of our arterial BRT platforms. On the next slide, you can see what stations look like once civil construction is substantially complete. 
This is a site here at Chicago and 34th Street where in this photo you can see on the right side a seat wall um, that separates the platform from the sidewalk behind and a grate where a tree will be planted to provide some shade for customers at this location. And further back um, behind the orange, you can see the foundations for pylon and shelter. Um, some sites are more complex, but generally speaking, the majority of D-Line stations take about two months from the first orange cones to get to this state. Um, but there's quite a bit of work to be done before D-Line operations can commence next year. Much of this is going to be a lot less impactful to the traveling public as we switch gears from the major road construction phase into installing shelters and pylons, completing the electrical fiber technology and equipment installations, and finally certifying the stations and systems as safe for customer operations. Um, in the meantime, we're also taking delivery of buses and a lot of other things we need to be ready for opening day. We're off to a great start this year and we're really excited to open the D-Line next year. Um, as we move to the next slide, Beyond opening day, we're also tracking three future changes to the D-Line project. Uh, first, we're very excited to be adding a new station in North Minneapolis that will serve both the C-Line and the D-Line at Osteo and 47th Avenue. Uh, we received a lot of feedback about this in earlier planning processes, and adding this station now is possible because Hennepin County is redesigning the street for a reconstruction beginning in 2023 um, that supports BRT in that reconstruction redesign. Secondly, we're adapting our plans at Portland Avenue and 77th Street down in Richfield to coordinate with MnDOT's major project, changing the Portland Avenue interchange on 494. Uh, a temporary station that's under construction right now will serve our customers on D-Line opening day, but this will be replaced by a permanent station to be built with that future project. For these two, um, we intend to bring an amendment to the D-Line station plan before the council later this year to both reflect the added station at Osteo and 47th and the change station at Portland and 77th. And finally, at Chicago and 38th Street, um, as we've communicated previously, we removed the planned station there from our construction plans following the murder of George Floyd and subsequent protests in that space. Uh, plans for a station there will develop in the future, working closely with the city and community around the long-term vision for the area. As we move to the next slide, I'll move on to the B line and just briefly mention um, that we are preparing for the transition from planning into engineering. Um, as we move to the next slide, um, a little bit on our 2021 B line progress, Adam in his upcoming business item, we'll go into more detail on the planning milestones ahead. Um, but I want to just point out that as that work continues, we're moving through procurement for an engineering and construction administration consultant to begin preliminary design on the D-Line this fall. Um, and along the way, we're also working very closely with our local partners to both identify how the B-Line will fit into the corridor, identify the local scope that they'd like to see delivered in coordination with the B-Line, and coordinating the B-Line with other projects, including um, other major transit lines led by Metro Transit. Next slide, please. The next project in our pipeline is the Metro E line from the U of M to Southdale. Um, of course, once again, the major news here is that the 40 million in estimated remaining need is anticipated to be filled by the recent state appropriation, joining the federal and council funds already identified. Next slide. This year, uh, we are advancing more detailed station, excuse me, detailed corridor planning, including traffic analysis and environmental documentation in order to finalize the proposed station locations and release a draft corridor plan for public review this fall. We also anticipate beginning procurement for engineering this fall so that in the spring of 22, staff can bring two actions to the council, one to approve a final corridor plan and a second to award an engineering contract. Next slide, please. I wanna also on this corridor specifically highlight the coordinated projects and partnerships with um, particularly Minneapolis and Hennepin County that are critical to successfully delivering the E-Line and meeting other transportation goals while being efficient with public resources and minimizing our overall impact. The map here calls out five of the major projects in development now, um, each of which has various levels of E-Line ready design incorporated. And this includes three bike, pred, excuse me, bike ped projects and two full street reconstructions, including in downtown Minneapolis and in uptown. Uh, the photo here shows in downtown Minneapolis um, foundations that have been completed and are ready for shelters to be installed later on this winter. Next slide. Finally, the next project in the pipeline is the Metro F line on the Central Avenue corridor. 
um, following council action to select this line and following the tab action to allocate regional solicitation funds to the corridor. Our initial steps in the corridor are to convene with cities and counties and MINDAS to introduce the project development process um, before beginning that planning work um, and public engagement in earnest later this winter. And I'll note that we're also working closely with MnDOT as they lead a much broader transportation study of the Central and University Avenue corridor. Um, we're really excited, as I mentioned, to dig in to understand exactly how the recent appropriation can advance this corridor as well. And on the next slide, this, this concludes my presentation. I've got a, a link here to a clearinghouse of information on all of these projects. Um, and Chair, I can answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Ruth. Um, are there any questions by committee members? I don't see everyone's screen. Uh, if you're on the phone, if you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and speak up. Looks like uh, there are no questions. So at this time, I will ask if there is, uh, did you want, okay, so since this is the um, information portion, there is no motion that needs to be taken. So then we need to go up to item 2021-152, Metro D-Line Amendment to Design and Construction. And I believe it's uh, Shahan, Shaheen, I won't try to pronounce your last name, so go, go ahead please with your uh, presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, committee members. Our request today on business item 2021-152 would authorize the regional administrator to execute amendment number one to contract 18P182 with HDR Engineering Incorporated for design and construction support services for the D-Line BRT project to increase the contract value by $2,640,810 for a revised contract value not to exceed $11,926,474. Contract uh, 18P182 was executed with HDR in December of 2018 to include design, engineering, and construction support services for the D-Line BRT project as well as limited design and construction support efforts to construct locally requested pedestrian and signal improvements along the corridor in coordination with Hennepin County and the cities of Minneapolis and Bloomington. As the project progressed, multiple factors continued, uh, contributed to the need for additional support services under this contract, resulting in an increase in contract value by 2640000 $810. During project design, our local partners each modified the magnitude of their locally requested scope uh, based on their needs and available, available budgets. This resulted, resulted in rework and additional costs incurred for the local, locally requested scope. As the project design progressed, the fiber conduit design was fast-tracked uh, with the goal of awarding it as a separate construction package in order to better position the project for completion within schedule. Due to the unfavorable uh, 2020 bidding environment, however, the advertisement was canceled and the fiber conduit was repackaged with the rest of the D-line construction requiring additional design efforts. The final project scope and uh, the compressed two-year construction uh, schedule along with limited council staff availability to administer construction, have also resulted in the need for additional construction phase consultant support within this contract to ensure adequate construction supervision and oversight. Alongside the scope modifications during project design, additional consultant support is needed for the design and delivery of the three future D-Line BRT stations discussed earlier at Osseo Road and 47th Avenue, Chicago and 38th Street, and Portland and uh, 77th Street. As mentioned earlier, uh, a separate future council action will be requested to amend the D-Line station plan uh, with added or changed uh, station locations as coordinated uh, planning efforts advance. 
advanced, uh, but the uh, design support services needs are uh, being brought forward in this amendment. Lastly, the DBE goal on this contract was set at 20% and the HDR has met this goal and will maintain their DBE utilization with this amendment. The proposed council action again uh, in uh, business item 2021-152 would authorize the regional administrator, the administrator to execute amendment number one to contract 18P182 with HDR engineering for design and construction support services for the Zuland BRT project to increase the contract value by $2,640,810 for a revised contract value not to exceed $11,926,474. At this point, Madam Chair, I would be happy to answer any questions on this business item. Are there any questions on this item? Any questions on this item? If not, I would like to ask if there is a motion for the proposed action. It's Fredson, I'll move the staff recommendation. Motion right. by Fredson. Is there a second? How many seconds? Discussion. Any discussion? If there is no further discussion, uh, can we take a roll call? Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez Sterner? Zirin? Zirin's aye. Barber and Shambliss? Aye. Council member, I think you're still muted. Chair, sorry, Chair Chambliss. Yeah, I'm having, I'm forgetting about the mute button. <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted now. With that, we will go on to item 2021-153, Metro B-Line authorization to release recommended corridor plan for public comment. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adam Smith. I'm a senior planner uh, with Metro Transit BRT projects. Uh, next slide, please. The chair and committee members, item 2021-153 requests that the council authorize release of the Metro B line recommended corridor plan for public review and comment and direct staff to collect public comments through Friday, August 13th summarize comments and report findings to the Metropolitan Council. Next slide, please. The recommended plan builds upon initial corridor recommendations developed in 2019 and 2020 with planning activities, including public outreach and engagement, interagency coordination and system analysis. Uh, a draft version of this plan was published in February of this year and comments were accepted through March. The purpose of the recommended plan is to report back to the public with a summary of what we heard and feedback to the draft plan, present changes and updates made to the plan based on feedback and continued agency coordination, and to provide a continued opportunity for public comment in advance of a final plan, which will be brought to the council this fall. Uh, upon completion and approval, the plan will identify the final planned locations for B-Line stations, um, beginning the, um, the engineering phase, uh, which would go into 2022, followed by construction for the project beginning in 2023. Next slide, please. So the council's action here is the critical step of se setting those station locations um, at the platform level. And this is the point in the process where that decision is made. So in addition to the BRT station locations, the plan includes information about station facilities, uh, service characteristics, and potential bus priority treatments to help meet the project's speed and reliability goals. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, the a draft version of the plan was released in February uh, with significant communications and outreach activities uh, conducted during the following comment period. Over 650 comments were received in addition to 
um, ongoing interagency coordination during that time. And staff made efforts to ensure that materials were shared with and available to uh, those who work, live, and use this corridor every day, um, which includes substantial communities of color. Postcards were mailed to residents, businesses, and property owners along the corridor, and laminated flyers were posted near Route 21 bus stops with information about the plan and how to provide feedback. And both of these featured text translated into Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. In addition to translation of general project materials, staff did conduct some limited surveying throughout the parts of the corridor, uh, focusing on the areas that serve the most customers, though uh, some of the in-person work was uh, somewhat limited due to COVID protocols. And project information has been shared with community and advocacy groups along the corridor that have a demonstrated uh, history of serving diverse populations. Next slide, please. So in terms of main themes that we heard, um, in terms of public comments, heard uh, broad support for bus priority treatments, again, in support of the project's primary goals to improve transit speed and reliability along this corridor. Many comments were also received regarding general station and platform locations, um, including substantial support for an eastbound platform location at Selby and Arundel. And these two comment themes uh, led to changes made in the recommended plan, uh, which I'll summarize in the next slide. Um, two other common areas of comments will be addressed at future points in our project development process, including questions around uh, service planning, uh, which includes frequency and routing of local service along the corridor to supplement the B line as well as concerns regarding bicycle connections and safety, which will be addressed further as part of the engineering phase. Next slide, please. Um, so feedback from the public and ongoing interagency coordination shaped a number of revisions in the recommended plan, including additional discussion of potential bus priority treatments informed by efforts to balance those treatments with other agency goals and plans within the corridor. And to better accommodate some of those other potential roadway improvements being considered, near side platforms are now recommended at three locations, Lake and Lindale, Lake and Bloomington, and Lake and Cedar. Um, each of these station locations had previously been shown as far side locations in the draft plan. You can see sort of the images below referring to uh, the far side locations that were included in the draft plan and now um, the near side platform locations included in the recommended plan. Um, and finally, the draft plan had presented two potential locations for an eastbound platform in the Arundel and Western area of Selby Avenue. And based on additional review of design constraints, as well as the public feedback we heard um, at that station location, the far side Arundel location is what is incorporated in the recommended corridor plan. Next slide, please. And so as part of public outreach and engagement surrounding the recommended plan, um, we'll be really focusing on reaching future Beeline Station neighbors, again, with the use of direct mailings to residents, businesses, and property owners around stations, um, station-specific info sheets to help support uh, more in-person conversations and door knocking activities. And again, we'll continue leveraging those relationships with um, community organizations and groups along the corridor to reach folks who uh, are in those station areas. Um, we'll also be continuing corridor-wide engagement with a robust uh, project website with information and the ability to make comments, uh, emails to subscribers, again, in-person feedback at key bus stops, project fact sheets, and use of Metro Transit social media. Next slide. So to conclude with this item, staff requests that the council authorize release of the Metro B line recommended corridor plan for public review and comment and direct staff to collect public comments through Friday, August 13, summarize comments and report the findings to the Metropolitan Council. And with that chair, I will answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Are there any questions?
Any questions? I do have one question. Um, this is um, very interesting to see the process of engagement for, and planning for uh, this uh, project. I saw the numbers of the um, comments, which was really good, but it, is it possible perhaps um, to think about in the future additional graphics? Because I'd like to see kind of where the comments are coming from. Are they surveys and what um, parts of town are they coming from? That would be really um, kind of maybe taking it to the next level. But thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Um, if there are no more, um, I don't know if you want to respond, um, but. Um, yeah, I, I can um, just say that at, at the draft quarter plan stage, we um, we did provide sort of more of an open-ended comment form. So we weren't um, collecting some of that demographic information in terms of specific locations. Um, but I will say that quite a few commenters um, offered some of that information saying, oh, I, you know, I use this stop, I use this stop, I, I would, I guess in the future I'll go over here. Um, so we did have some of that location specific information, which is helpful, but um, not across all of those 650 plus comments. Okay, thank you. If there are no further questions, I would like to ask if there is a motion for the proposed action. Prince, I'll move the staff recommendation. The motion has been made. Is there a second? Coming seconds. Seconded by Cummings. Um, any discussion? No, Sarah, I heard your mouth move. <laughs> I said, call the roll. Call the roll. Okay. Uh, we will call the roll then. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez, Sterner, Zirin. Zirin's aye. Barber and Chambliss. Aye. Thank you. We will go on to the next item on the agenda. And that is 2020-154 tra P's Transit Master Sole Source for Bus Hardware. Yeah, and, uh, good afternoon, Vice Chair Chambliss and Council Members. <clears throat> uh, this afternoon, I have the following proposed action item that the Metropolitan Council authorized the sole source contract for trapeze to upgrade bus hardware for the Transit Master System. I have a brief presentation of the project here. Uh, next page, please. So what is Transit Master? Transit Master is our computer-aided dispatch and automatic vehicle location system. It's used for real-time communication to and from the bus fleet to monitor and manage the bus operations in the field. Next, uh, next slide, please. So in the overview here, the equipment that we're gonna upgrade is on the right side, so the mobile equipment. Um, we'd be upgrading the controller, which is a uh, known as the IVLU, and the uh, mobile data terminal, which is called the MDT. Next slide, please. So the current situation is uh, Transmaster was installed 20 years ago. Uh, so over the 20 years, we have five generations of bus computers or hardware known as the IVLU. Currently, all five generations are still used within the bus fleet. Next slide, please. So the reason for the upgrade is the three oldest generations are in the life right now. New systems are, we have new system software enhancements that are coming that require uh, the buses to have the latest two generations of Vibel use to use the enhancements. Um, there's a, for the, the new generation of uh, Vibel use can run the new enhanced user interface, which is required to take advantage of these system software enhancements. Uh, next slide, please. So the reason for the system enhancements is it allows Transit Control Center to provide better direction to operators, allows operators and customers to receive more accurate, organized and detailed messages and detour information. It also allows uh, technology systems and radio group easier management of diagnostics so uh, 
lowering the failure rate of the buses and increasing more accurate data for the TCC and reporting. Next slide, please. Is there one more slide? We get cut off. Anyways, so, um, another slide for our presenter. I'm sorry. Well, I thought we had another slide. Uh, so, anyways, the proposed uh, action for uh, for today is that the Metropolitan Council authorize award and execute the sole source contract 21P163 with Trapeze Group in the amount not to exceed one million three hundred eighty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars for the bus upgrade or our hardware upgrade. And with that, Madam Chair, are there any questions I can answer? Any questions, council members? Council member Zarin moves the recommended staff recommendation. Thank you. Is there a second? It's Fred's and all second. Okay. Uh, the motion has been made and seconded. So therefore the motion has been approved. It's been a very quiet group, so there's probably not a whole lot of further discussion. Um, so at this point, I think we can take the roll. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez Sterner? Zirin? Aye. Barber? And Chambliss? Aye. We will go on to, <laughs> I'm getting encouragement. Thank you. This is my first uh, chairing of the meeting, so I appreciate that. Uh, we'll go on to the next item, 2021-157, approval of Ramsey County, Ramsey County FTA pilot program. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council Members. My name is Katherine Hansen, and I'm a Senior Project Manager in our TOD office at Metro Transit. Uh, I just want to mention that we have Ramsey County staff, uh, Met Council, OEO staff, and the TOD director on the line in case there are potential questions. Today, I'm asking that you recommend to the council authorization of a subrecipient grant agreement with Ramsey County for advanced stationary planning along the rush line. The FTA grant of $1.25 million will be paid as reimbursements to the county through Metro Transit in accordance with the subrecipient grant agreement. This is the third FTA TOD pilot program grant in this region. Others were a $1.2 million grant for the Blue Line Extension LRT project and a $1 million grant for the Gold Line BRT project. Those two grants have been successfully closed out. If the committee recommends council authorization of this SGA, this item will come to the Met Council at their July 14th meeting. Next slide, please. The Rush Line BRT project is 15 miles long, serving 15 city, uh, five cities. Starting at Union Depot in St. Paul, the line proceeds through Maplewood, Vandas Heights, Gem Lake, and White Bear Lake. There are 21 stations along this alignment. The BRT will co-locate with the Bruce Vento Trail, which is highlighted in yellow on the map. Ramsey County is managing this phase of the BRT project and anticipates receiving environmental approvals from the FTA in the fall of 2021. At that point, the project will enter the New Starts project development phase and be managed by the Met Council. Next slide, Next slide please. The $1.2 million grant was added to the Met Council Unified Budget in February of 2021. The local contribution is a 27.7% percentage match and is made up of 
a cash, a cash match of $312,500 from the Ramsey County Regional Rail Authority and an additional $166,821 of in-kind match, which comes from the five entities noted in the yellow box. Next slide, please. Uh, Metro Transit will pass the funds to Ramsey County through the subrecipient grant agreement. Uh, Metro Transit will approve the invoices and um, complete the qu quarterly reporting and compliance with the FTA requirements. In addition, uh, there is a 15% DBE goal, which will be monitored by Met Council's OEO office. Ramsey County will hire and oversee the consultants to assist with completing this scope of services. And Ramsey County plans on issuing this RFP uh, later on this summer in, in consultation with uh, the partner cities and the TOD office. Next slide, please. The timeline for these activities is a two year time frame between September 2021 and September 2023. The timing of starting the grant activities with the anticipated start of the New Starts project development phase, it allows coordination between land use planning and the specifics of the BRT project. Um, the specific tasks that will be completed uh, through this grant are uh, public and stakeholder engagement, uh, real estate analysis, a housing gaps analysis, um, stationary concepts and development plans, and finally, um, an implementation plan. Next slide, please. So today we are requesting the Transportation Committee recommend approval of the subrecipient grant agreement between Ramsey County and Met Council for advanced stationary planning on the rush line. Next slide. Thank you very much. And I would be happy to take any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I would like to take a motion for the proposed action that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute intergovernmental agreement 21I001, which is a pass through subrecipient grant agreement with Ramsey County for the 1,250,000 FTA pilot program for a TOD planning grant award. Is there a motion? Fredson, I'll uh, move the staff recommendation. Moved by Fredson. Is there a second? Coming seconds. Coming okay. seconds. Um, with that, the motion has been uh, approved. Um, this is really good. I'm glad that um, we were able to get this um, pilot program going. So uh, let's take a roll call. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez Sterner? Zirin? Zirin's aye. Barber? Chambliss? Aye. Chair, you're muted. Moving on, we have a 2021-164 SWLRT Green Line Extension Change Order. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, this is Jim Alexander. I'm the uh, Project Director for Southwest LRT. And uh, this action involves the uh, uh, authorizing the Regional Administrator to, through the Southwest Light Rail Transit Council Authorized Representative to negotiate and execute a change order for contract 15 P 307 a with London Macross and joint venture in an amount not to exceed $4,354,203 and 30 cents for grouting of the Kenilworth tunnel construction. Uh, Madam chair, the and committee members, the, the background on this is that uh, the contractor has installed uh, sheeting 
which is a part of the support of excavation for the half mile long tunnel in the Kenilworth corridor as part of SOWLRT project. And uh, we have uh, observed some separation of, uh, of the sheets in some certain locations. And while this doesn't uh, jeopardize the structural integrity, it does allow a migration of sand and water into the excavation, which uh, could pose some uh, challenges outside of the excavation in terms of some settlement, which uh, we don't want to have happen. So we're looking to uh, bring on board a, 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 a specialty subcontractor to do grouting at uh, select locations along the railroad side of the uh, of that uh, tunnel corridor to uh, to prevent that uh, migration of the material by putting in grout uh, at those locations where we see that uh, we're going to have some gaps in between the sheets. So just a little background on the uh, on the contract with LMJV. We're about 50% uh, complete with the construction, and uh, they have a DBE goal of 16% uh, in their contract, and they're currently achieving a little over 20% of participation. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Council member? I believe you're on mute. I just wanted to join the mute club here. Uh, I'm off now. Uh, okay, I just wanted to make a comment actually. I, I, you know, I appreciate the fact that uh, the when we were engaging in this particular uh, area, it was causing extra vibration and the, the project office res was responsive to the concerns that that was causing and switched methodology to the press and piler. And, you know, it's impossible to know exactly what's under as we have discovered uh, many times as and everyone knows when you're working underground, you don't know what's down there. So anyway, um, you know, this is an unfortunate consequence of that, but I think that it really was responsive to the people who were concerned about the vibrations and so forth. So it was a, a positive move and um, with with some repercussions that perhaps weren't anticipated. Um, but necessary to do. So I appreciate the responsiveness to the concerns of the residents in the area. And then I think it's just great that uh, we're achieving 20% DBE participation uh, when the goal is 16. So hopefully that will continue, looks like it will. And again, I just appreciate the efforts to mitigate the situations as they come along. There will be more. And as they pop up, I, I just appreciate Jim and his team and all of the, the workers on the project office um, mitigating the concerns of the residents and minimizing the cost, but being responsive as well. So thanks for this overview of, of what's being done, Mr. Alexander, I appreciate it. Thank you, council member. Are there any other comments or questions? If not, um, I guess I will also say that I agree with council member Cummings. It's great that um, we have an opportunity to make an improvement and um, uh, you know reduce that ground vibration. So at this time, I'm going to ask that the proposed motion that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator through the Southwest Light Rail Transit uh, to negotiate and execute a change order for contract 15P307A with Linda, Linda McCrossin Joint Venture in an amount not to exceed $4,354,203.30 for grouting for the Kenilworth Tunnel construction. Is there a motion? Cummings moves approval. Zarin Cummings second. moves approval and Zarin seconds. That means it's passed. Can we call the roll? Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez Sterner. Zarin. Zarin's aye. Barbara Chambliss. Hi. Thank you so much. Let's go on to our final item, which is 2021-165 Metropolitan Transportation Service Agency Safety Plan. Mr. Brody. Thank you and good afternoon, Madam Chair and Committee members. I am Andrew Brony, Manager of Bus Safety for MTS. As you may recall, this time last year, the original MTS agency safety plan was brought to the transportation community for review under business item 2020-196. This item before you this afternoon is revision one of the MTS agency safety plan. 
An annual plan review and updates are required by 49 CFR Part 673. This revi revised plan must be approved by the governing board. The changes that were made this year during the review process were minor in nature. The biggest change was to add our van pool program to the plan as suggested after voluntarily submitting the plan to the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, also known as PTAS, Technical Assistance Center, TAC. Other changes include the addition of procedural details since the onboarding of my position as the manager of safety last October of 2020. All changes were included in, in attachment to the meeting agenda. This action promotes multiple Thrive's MSP 2040 outcomes. Equity, livability as supported through the plan's focus on strategies to continue a safe transit infrastructure, the safe transport of all customers and pro promote the well-being of transit employees, the plan's role in mitigating risk and promoting proactive planning to responsibly manage the region's finite resources fosters the outcome of stewardship. Uh, the proposed action is that the Metro Council adopt revision one of the MTS agency safety plan as required by 49 CFR part 673. And with that, I will take any questions. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, I will ask a motion as proposed. Cummings moves approval. Cummings moves approval. Is there a second? It's Fredson, I'll second the staff recommendation. Seconded by Fredson, that motion is approved. Thank you so much. And we will go to our information item. Uh, Chair, I need to call the roll quick. Yes, uh, of course. Roll call, Cummings. please. Yeah, thank you. Cummings? Aye. Ferguson? Aye. Fredson? Aye. Gonzalez Sterner? Zirin? Aye. Barber? Chambliss? Aye. And Chair, before we go on, do you guys want to decide which items, if any, you want to go consent to Council? Uh, yeah, let's take a look at those items. Um, so normally we have those items that are pretty straightforward um, that go forward. I should probably thought about that before, but um, is there anyone who thinks that there is anything that should not go on consent? That we should be my only, in the next meeting? Uh, Chair, my only suggestion would be number six. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, so we'll move everything except for item number six to consent and then item number six 2021 dash 164 will be non consent. Okay, um, so do we take a roll? Do we take a roll? Yet? No, no chair. Okay. I just write it down and then um, we'll take care of it. Thank you very oh, much. Okay, thank you. Um, so then um, our Nine consent items are complete and we will go to information item number two, Minneapolis bus garage. Mr. Rinstead. All right, thank you, Greg. Uh, good afternoon, uh, chair and council members. I'm Robert Rimstead with uh, engineering facilities. I also have with me on the, the call today, I also have Lisa Klein, uh, the manager of construction services, and I have Stan, Olson, Stan, Stan Owens, the uh, the primary uh, contract administrator, the, the construction manager on site on this project every day to, to help with uh, any questions that you may have. And so I'm gonna run through a uh, presentation on the Minneapolis bus garage, just a bi-yearly update here for the, uh, the progress that we're making over there on site. So next slide, please. So just uh, this is a similar slide that we've shown over the last uh, couple of presentations as we continue to uh, work on this project. Uh, it's uh, just northwest of our existing Haywood garage and the, the, the office of the police facility, police facility that we uh, finished construction in 2019 on. Um, and again, here's the, the project statistics about it as to uh, the, the overall size and capacity of it. So next slide, please. 
And here's the, the project history. We've been uh, planning and, and, and forecasting this project for a long time. And right now we're, we're focused on that, that key construction at that key construction stage. So we anticipate continuing to build this building and, and finishing it up at the end of 22 and being able to start serving bus operations in 2023. Uh, we also have uh, planned some additional uh, future projects that you'll see a little bit later on in the uh, the budget slide. But we're we're planning that uh, future solar array and battery storage to to start design yet this year, and and construction uh, the following years. And then also uh, we've we've done the initial work to bring in electric bus infrastructure into the base project. And then as funding becomes available, we'll be able to continue to build out. This facility for those uh, electric buses here. All right, next slide. So the last time we gave an update was in January 2021, and this is what the site looked like. Uh, this is just an aerial shot, kind of looking towards downtown Minneapolis. There, oh, if you can back up one, please. Are you able to back up a little bit, please? Just slide four. Okay. So here's the site as we left it uh, in December, the steel framing had kind of gone on the east side and then the precast had started in early December and anticipated that work would go through uh, August of 2021 or August of this year. All right, next slide. So here again is is it really January and February and really this year, it's just been precast, precast, precast. It's kind of neat to see the trucks coming to the site, each carrying kind of a, a various piece and then be able to uh, start to erect it almost just like a little erector set or a Lego set. And then here's a, another picture of that going up. So again, this wasn't quite there in January, but now you can actually get on that main level where the buses are gonna go. And this is the view looking down that main uh, maintenance aisle. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in March, uh, it's interesting to see this project develop as they started to build from the east side and then are progressing yeah, to, to the west side, and you actually have the roof starting to go on it in, in March of the year. You have the windows going on, the facade going on. So really, you have part of the building that's really getting further along into completion, yet the other side, the structural framing is not even there yet. The foundations are in, um, but that precast is a continuous work, but they're able to work on that east side and, and keep moving to the west. Next slide. And so it's really interesting to see the uh, structural framing go. So this is the the, the one of the air, the work areas where the uh, bus hoist will go, that um, the lift up the bus in the bus maintenance area. And so this is that framing that'll support that system to lift that whole bus all the way up on top uh, to be able to maintain underneath it. Next slide, please. And so here in April of 2021, you can start to see the that facade picture it looks a little bit like the rendering like we had on the front of the screen here. And um, again, you see this whole side going on with the screen here on the front, and then you see the, um, the, the, the gap of the building at the back of the building there. So, next slide. And so here on the inside of the building on that main level of the, of the bus garage is uh, it's supported on that structural framing system we saw, but then there's insulation, rebar, and this is what we call the topping slab. And so there's, uh, the whole main level of the bus garage is covered um, with that topping slab. And right now, as of to date, I believe that they've finished nine of the 25 pours on the site, but you can kind of see how much effort work goes into this, this area here. All right, next slide. So here are a couple pictures that we grabbed from earlier in the month and you can see uh, this larger roof area uh, going in and they've uh, completed a portion of the roof on the east side and they're continuing to work on the, on the larger portion of it. But here is a nice inside shot of where the, the main drivers, uh, uh, bus driver's check-in room is where we tried to really have a, nice, a few nice elements in there to let a lot of daylight in and try to open up the space and get some additional views in there. All right, next slide. So here's just a, a few fun facts for that what's been installed to date. So roughly 2,200 or 3,000 plus pieces of precast have gone in, uh, about 17,000 yards of concrete, about two and a half times the, the, the volume of the Goodyear blimp have, have been have gone in. Um, about 60 buses full of weight of rebar has gone into the site, and 
on that roofing uh, so far they've gotten 0.6 they might be a little bit closer to that one mark now as we've uh, they continue to make progress on that roof here but the roof is about six football fields in area so they've gotten about 0.6 of that done all right next slide so again, just a reminder of some of the sustainability highlights here on the right is a picture of that rainwater tank going in uh, last fall uh, to save some money on the on the bus wash system. Uh, we do have that geothermal system that was installed in the piles that is going to uh, get fully connected into the building to help heat and cool areas of it. On uh, the, the, uh, the facade facing the, the 7th Street, there are on the south side, there's some uh, thermal wall paneling to help preheat that outside air in the wintertime. And, reduce the amount of uh, that outside air or increase the temperature of that outside air coming in. And we also have LED lighting and that future solar array. Next slide. So again, here on the on the left hand side is that total budget for the project and uh, then where the, the funding streams have come in for it. Next slide. And as far as our DBE participation, uh, the goal on the construction contract is 15%. Right now, they are at, uh, through mid May, they're at 13.4% uh, participation. A lot of the work on the DBEs is a little bit later on the project. One of the DBEs is, is top all roofing. And as I just, you know, mentioned, the, the roofing is, is 0.6. You know, they have a lot more roofing work to do, so there'll be a lot more participation in the later stages of the, of the project. And then on the ITL contract, the goal is 10% and they're tracking right now at 9.8% uh, to meet that goal. Next slide. And so with that, I'll take any questions and I just wanna thank the staff here that are uh, that are really participating in our engineering facilities group from Lisa, Lisa Klein, Stan Owens, Mark Lanthier, Renee Dutfour, Cole Mullins, Kira Desmond and Molly Ellis have, have really put in a tremendous amount of time and effort on this project. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Remstad, and thank you everyone who worked on this project. Are there any questions? Any questions? Um, well, while we're waiting, if anybody does have any questions, um, this is really cool, and I loved your analogy to Legos and Erector sets. Uh, that's where it all begins, right? Um, and so um, not only is this um, you know, a good project for how um, we develop to get these ideas, but I really love the uh, way that we're using solar energy and we're conserving water and um, working on um, you know, green options for our building and development. So um, it's good to be part of an organization that cares about that. Does anybody else have any comments or questions before we move on to the other information item? Looks like no. So thank you very much for that presentation. Right. Nope. Thanks for, for listening. And uh, my kids are also interested in the same thing, so they're excited to see the presentation too. So thanks for everyone's patience. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I'm glad they got to see it. Take your kids to work, right? <laughs> Okay, um, our next presentation is on the Metro Transit mobile app. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Bruce Howard, Director of Marketing and Transit Information. And if um, you don't mind, while Greg's pulling up the presentation there, I'm going to do a brief introduction to this next item. Um, so uh, Metro Transit launched its first mobile app back in late 2016. And in addition to giving customers another way to check schedules, plan trips, and see transit vehicles on the map in real time, uh, we were, for the first time, able to offer our customers mobile tickets. In other words, a customer could plan a trip, track the approaching transit vehicle, and pay for their fare all on the new Metro Transit mobile app. And this has really proved to be a very popular option. Uh, we sold over $4 million in mobile tickets in 2019. So the contract to develop and host that first mobile uh, app for Metro Transit expires in July. And uh, back in January, you may recall, we brought a business item to the Transportation Committee and then the Council to enter into a new contract to develop what uh, we might call Metro Transit Mobile App 2.0, the uh, next generation of our mobile app. And this next generation will do everything that the initial app can do, but we decided to partner with a new vendor, Token Transit, because we feel their approach 
to mobile apps and mobile ticketing really sets us up to do much more going forward. And so today, uh, Adam Mel, who is the uh, project lead here and a senior market development specialist, is going to give you an update on that uh, transition to our mobile app 2.0. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, yeah, I would like to just you know start and say that the new transit app, uh, our vendor Token Transit, is working on developing it now, and I'll just walk you through it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Bruce mentioned that this is um, something that's going to be similar at launch to our current mobile app, um, but really the reason we went with this vendor was uh, looking at the next phase of mobile ticketing. Um, as, as Bruce noted, it's been very successful for us. And um, what we're looking to do is increase the utility to the customer. Uh, this new version and this new vendor really um, has an app that's designed for flexibility for everyone. The big reason we chose this vendor was their vision of selling mobile tickets, both in our own agency app and other third party apps was, was really the direction we wanted to go. We're looking at a future here where there's still the Metro Transit mobile app, but really uh, you can purchase tickets, whatever transportation planning app you're using. Uh, people we know are using things like the Transit app, Google Maps, even um, Lyft and Uber are moving into putting transit into their apps as well. So there's a lot of ways people get transit information and we're looking to be able to meet them where they are and on the apps that they're using uh, with mobile tickets. Additionally, one of the other big changes for this app is we're looking to go to a more regionally focused ticket. If you're familiar with the old ticket, or excuse me, I should say the current ticket, um, it's very heavily Metro Transit branded. Uh, it has our vehicles and our liveries and our colors all over it um, on the ticket itself. One thing we know is that our ticket is a regional ticket, whether it's um, being used on Metro Transit or Minnesota Valley, um, that ticket represents the region. And one of the things we'd like to do with this new ticket is move to a more regional design. You can see a, um, a draft ticket. That this, is, this is pretty close to what it will look like. There's some minor tweaks here and there, but generally what we're doing is trying to look to a more universal branding uh, and match our current regional fare product, the GoTo card. So you'll see that GoTo logo in the center of the circle, uh, the blue circle. And um, hopefully it's something that will be a little more appealing to our Metro Transit um, regional partners. You know, we want to be respectful of their customers and their branding. Um, and we want to be able to allow them to sell that ticket in their own apps should they choose to go that way as well. Another reason we went with this vendor. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, we're looking towards moving to other apps and selling our Metro Transit tickets. Uh, elsewhere than just the Metro Transit app. This is all about reducing barriers. This is the this was the genesis of the new of the mobile ticket when we first did this. Uh, it was a way for customers who don't carry cash or exact change and don't have a go-to card to be able to ride. You know, we know people are carrying less and less cash these days and getting a go-to card takes some steps and is in a, a barrier to riding instantly. Mobile apps cut that out and you can pay with multiple payments with credit cards, PayPal, Apple Pay, et cetera. So as Bruce mentioned, you can go from looking at next trip to see when your bus is arriving to purchasing your fare and riding within a matter of seconds, even if you don't have the app downloaded at that time. Uh, as I noted, we know customers are using many apps to access, uh, access transit. Um, we know that that's the case. Um, we're moving to support that even better than we have in the past. We've always provided data to these apps, but um, we're now providing even better formats in Google Transit, excuse me, uh, GTFS, GTFS real time, et cetera, to allow these third party apps to have better data. Now, what we want to do is be able to have customers use that app, book that trip, and buy their ticket without ever having to leave. And that's something that we can do now with this new mobile app um, in the not too distant future. Um, they, their, their system allows for easy creation and implementation of mobile ticketing and, and really helps us build back to how do we keep it easy for the customer. We don't want to make people use a, a different app if they're used to using one and riding and happy. Um, let's meet them where they are and let them buy the ticket where they are without making it too complicated for them. Next slide, please. This also helps uh, move us forward in our shared mobility plan. Um, it allows us to be on really any platform that wants to sell our tickets. Um, we obviously have the right of refusal. We can say yes or no, but it allows us to be really anywhere that uh, um, may want us. It also opens the door for things like mobility as a service, uh, ticket bundling, things where perhaps you pay a certain flat fee and you get X transit tickets per month and X rides on 
ride sharing and X bike share trips all for one flat fee. Uh, it allows us to get, get into that world a lot as well. It's important to note that ticketing data stays with Metro Transit. Um, while our tickets may be sold in Google, for example, uh, it still is payment processing data, um, ticket information is gonna come through our platform. So you're still gonna be buying our ticket. It just would be appearing within these other platforms. Um, another benefit of this is it allows us to have to, um, to move away from the older model of mobility integration that we at Metro Transit and really a lot of other transit agencies were exploring and have since began to move away from. And that is uh, the transit app being the aggregator of services. So for example, Metro Transit would have a bike share, a scooter share, a ride hailing service, et cetera, all on our app. Um, what that means is we would have to choose certain vendors we might have to exclude certain vendors that don't work with each other for example lyft and uber um, traditionally don't like to be on the same app so that avoids us having to say yes we pick this vendor and, and is that viewed as the custom from the customer some sort of implicit endorsement we, we are able to get away with that get away from that excuse me now we can be on all those individual apps as i noted uber and lyft bringing transit information into their apps google etc um, but it also helps us uh, be protected from some liability. Now, let's say one of those providers runs afoul of laws or has a PR issue that we do not want to be associated with. Well, it's simple enough to pull our one ticket off of one app, but still have our ticket out, out elsewhere, um, you know, in a dozen other apps, for example. Whereas if that was reversed, we might have to pull a service from our app and then now there's a gap and now we have to find a new vendor to fulfill the service. Um, it makes things a lot easier and allows us to be a lot more flexible while at the same time, again, meeting the customer's preference for whatever app they happen to have. Next slide, please. So quick timeline, um, we're really close to launch. Uh, we did our finalizing of requirements in May. Uh, development is going on now with the final uh, versions of that uh, as we're in testing currently to polish off the app. Internal communications are ramping up as well in terms of training bus operators and Metro Transit police on ticket inspection. Um, the ticket is functionally the same, but just looks a little different in, in getting folks ready to be able to do the inspection the same way they have, but just with a new, slightly different looking ticket. Working with our frontline staff, um, out there as well as our customer relations and transit information call centers to make sure that they're equipped to handle customer comments, questions, concerns, um, and transition to the new system long term. Our customer communications are going to be starting uh, early next week as we start informing customers that the app is going to be updated. Um, from a customer standpoint, when the app comes out, it'll be just like any update you have on your phone. Um, if your phone's set to auto update, it will, the new version will appear just like any anytime you get an update. You won't have to say delete your app and go download a new one. Um, the app is launching on July 16th at 9 p.m. Um, that's in the evening, uh, a time of low ridership. And then uh, that is a Friday as well. That gives a full weekend of auto update cycles, which generally happen around midnight for most folks. So that by the time Monday rolls around, the majority of people are already updated. Uh, we will have a time period between that 16th and uh, July 20th where both of the apps are in the market. Uh, you won't be able to purchase tickets on the old app. You will be able to activate tickets um, still, but it, it gives folks time to transition before we shut off the old app on July 20th. When customers install the new app or update to the new app, their tickets will transfer over. They'll be using the same account system that we've used, so their password and logins will remain the same. Um, it'll, it'll be a fairly seamless transition from a customer standpoint. And uh, the app is functionally almost identical, um, you know, slightly different menu layout and things like that, but all the same features, all the same links, all the same content will be there. So it, it will be a very familiar app to our customers. So we'll, we'll be starting, like I mentioned, on July 6th with some in-app messaging on the current app, letting people know that changes are coming, as well as emails to current app users. Uh, there'll be some social media to follow, but basically um, letting folks know that the new app is, update is coming, it's gonna be the same features they know and love, uh, and their information and, uh, excuse me, their tickets will be transferring over to the new version as well. Um, and as I mentioned, um, it'll be the same as what we have today. I did mention those third-party ticketing apps. Um, once the app launches, we're gonna start working on that. The goal hopefully we'll have that fall 2021 um, 
hammered out. There's some contracting issues and privacy issues we need to just sort of make sure we're being doing our due diligence on and protecting our customers' data and things like that uh, before we roll out. And then, of course, um, there once we do that, there will be another um, media and communications push to to make sure people know that that's happening because we're really excited about that. Um, next slide. Any questions? Any questions? I think this is so cool um, as a person that before the pandemic um, utilized public transportation a lot, um, these advancements and the integration with other modes of transportation is really cool, especially um, you know, when you are traveling um, off hours, uh, you may want to take the train and then um, catch an Uber, you know, all of those things can be um, planned out in advance. So this, this is great. Um, Fredson, I see that you are up. Are you, did you have a question? No questions, thanks. No, okay. Um, what else was I gonna say about that? Oh, when you um, load multiple trips to the app, is it possible to get a refund off of the app? Let's say you put too many on there. Do you know? All right, um, Madam Chair, are you speaking to like multiple tickets that you'd be riding, say with like three or four people or something like that? Well, either three or four people. Can um, Is this just one trip at a time? I thought you could get um, tickets for multiple trips. So for, for the Metro Transit app, you purchase um, individual tickets for individual rides. So you would buy a, a local bus Metro ticket for rush hour. And then that would be that two and a half hour period. Just like if you were to tag your go-to card or purchase a ticket with cash and get a paper transfer, um, that ticket would be valid for two and a half hours um, until until it expired. And then you would need to purchase another one. We, we aren't at the moment offering things like Metro Pass or All Day Pass or anything like that on the mobile app. It is something we're exploring. Um, there are some challenges to it, um, but it is isn't. Um, it is something we're exploring for now. Cool. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we have one um, more item. Um, thanks so much, Adam. Thank you. And uh, we will move to Transportation Improvement Program presentation by Joe Barbell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm here to talk about the 22 to 25 Transportation Improvement Program. And it just hit me during this meeting that um, I didn't, I, uh, that the agenda does not actually share the document itself with you. So um, I can share that after this meeting via email uh, if people want to see that um, 150 well, or so I pages. I actually have the presentation. Oh, the presentation we have, Madam Chair, but the document, the full tip. Uh, okay. 150 pages of fun. Um, yeah, I can find that online. <laughs> okay. Um, not that a lot of people really want to read that word for word, but I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, document from a higher level. And we have Molly McCartney here from MinDOT to talk about uh, their process of getting to the 2022 to 25 transportation improvement program, because probably about three quarters of the projects that you see in there are actually programmed by MinDOT, and MinDOT has a uh, very large effort to put together their annual program. So um, we can go to the next slide. So um, we'll start out with what a tip is. I think this might be uh, most for a lot of you your second time through, but I uh, certainly uh, should review a little bit and I'm going to turn on my video. Okay. Um, so a tip is a four year uh, program of transportation projects that are funded in part or in whole with federal funding. Any transportation infrastructure project funded with federal funding has to be in the transportation improvement program and this is a, an assurance that projects are um, vetted on the way uh, into the tip and have the opportunity to go through a public process so any tip as i said funded with federal transportation funds or that we define as um region significant and that's what's meant by air quality prioritization so an air quality project impacting project uh, regardless of who funds it has to uh, be in the tip and there's usually about, I don't know, 12 to 15 projects. Uh, they usually, that would fill that role. They usually receive federal funding anyway. So this is required for all agencies like ours uh, throughout the country. And then after we're done with the TIP, it gets incorporated to the MnDOT STIP, Statewide Transportation 
improvement program, and that is the necessary step for a public project to be able to get underway and receive federal funding. So next. Um, so uh, in the tip, uh, you have transit projects that are programmed by Metro, problem, by Metro Transit and the council along with FTA formula funds. You have um, roadway projects, uh, like I said, many program with MnDOT, but also, of course, um, uh, we have the regional solicitation funding. Um, and uh, I'll also add that uh, the MPO area actually does go outside of the Southern County area. There are small pieces of right in Sherburne County. Um, and this is based on census data from 2010. So we might see some changes in a couple of years, as well as a small piece uh, in Wisconsin across the, across the river from, um, from Stillwater. Uh, so next. So here's our schedule. Um, right now the tip is out for public comment. And last I checked, we had maybe 25 or so public comments. Uh, last year we had about 210 which was a record by probably about 195. So uh, we are bringing more comments in. And so um, there'll be a public comment uh, report produced um, for TAB at its August 18th meeting, at which time TAB, TAB will recommend approval to the council. And then you will see the final tip at your September 13th meeting, uh, hopefully to a recommend approval to the council at its September 22nd meeting. After that, we share the information, uh, the tip itself with MnDOT, who incorporates it into their STIP, and then Federal Highway Trans, uh, Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration need to approve it, and that usually occurs. That's kind of a a pessimistic November December. It usually occurs about November first. So next. So right now, as I mentioned, we're in a forty five day public review period. Um, uh, we do have this every year and um, thanks to our communication staff i think we've um, gathered more um, we've done a better job in the last three or so years of connecting with people and getting more comments um so uh we did have if you look at that bottom bullet a uh, virtual public meeting uh last week and we didn't have a lot of attendance we only had about 15 or 20 people there and one person made a comment about a specific project last year we had about three commenters um, and I think more attendees, but um, we do we do hold that and, and we did find that to be uh, a good way to pull people in from all over the region as opposed to a one site uh, in Minneapolis or St. Paul or someplace. Um, so there's been sort of a, a pretty high level of success with that, particularly compared to past years. Um, next. So um, I realize that it's almost six o'clock, so I don't know if people want me to just sort of blast through this. But uh, uh, the next few slides contain some of the larger, sort of more high profile projects seen in the tip. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Quarters of Commerce project um, program was funded. And so we ended up with four projects of fairly high dollar amounts. You'll see here 204 million, 157 million for these uh, larger projects here. I'll go to the next slide and we'll see a couple more of those, I believe. Um, uh, you know, throughout the region, 163 million, 56, that should be a 56M, 56 million, not 56 dollars. And um, that's just a, a big program that's funded to be statewide and we did get four projects in the region. So like I said, given the time, I'm gonna blast through it, but feel free to stop me with questions. Next. Uh, and then here's some key Metro Transit projects uh, that you, you certainly have heard plenty about the uh, Southwest LRT extension, the Botton LRT extension, and some of the uh, other lines that, uh, you'll, um, that are prevalent in the TIP. Uh, the uh, ABRT lines and the BRT lines. And I think, is there another slide of this? Uh, next slide. And here's some more. Um, the B line, the E line, Rush line, F line, of course, was the project that we funded with the last regional solicitation um, and, uh, in a uh, process that Peter Dugan discussed a little bit early on in the meeting. So next. And then we have just some examples of major highway projects that uh, I roughly cut off at about 60 million. Um, so these are some of the big projects uh, around the neighborhood, or sorry, around the region that are included in the tip. Uh, next. And then uh, this is a, a summary of how much funding we have, about $5.2 billion in the tip. You see that the lion's share comes from federal highway and transit um, funds, uh, but there's also a lot of state funding in there and property tax funding at 1.8 billion. And then um, trunk highway, that means state highway program funds. Uh, 
make up a small part at 530 million. And included in the federal highway and federal transit are our CMAC and STPBG uh, prod, uh, funds that fund our regional solicitation. And the match is included in that third bullet, property tax and state taxes. Um, next. Uh, here it is by mode, uh, just a different uh, way to show it with the pie chart. So about half of the, uh, tr of the, of the uh, tip is dedicated to transit, nearly half to highways, but you'll see smaller pieces for bike ped and um, others and set-asides. Set-asides uh, make up a big chunk of that. And set-asides are like, uh, it might be a lighting set-aside where uh, you're able to do smaller projects as they come uh, out of that set aside. They don't have to go through a big process. So there's set asides to do things, maintenance type of things as they come. Um, next. And so that's it. I know I went through that quickly um, in part because that's how I do it in part because I know time is of the essence. But by all means, if you have any questions right now or later on, feel free to let me know. Thanks a lot, um, Mr. Barbo. Um, are there any questions? Council members, well, we really appreciate um, this overview. We can see how many uh, projects are out in the field uh, and how we are connecting all of our transit projects together and supporting them. This is amazing um, what we're what our, our region is going to be looking like in the next even five years. It's, go it's going to be um, a tremendous change and a tremendous look and benefit for our community. So thank you to everyone who's presented today. And with that, uh, that ends the items on our agenda for this evening. And I will declare this meeting adjourned. So thank you and you all stay cool. <laughs>